Well, I just looked in the back of the room, and I have to um, point out something that I just saw that makes me very happy, um, unexpectedly. Um, some of you may know that um, LHON uh, was um, found, the 11778 mutation was found uh, quite some time ago by someone named Dr. Doug Wallace. And I just looked in the back of the room. Please stand up, Dr. Wallace, please. Please stand up, please. Thank you for being here. Thank you for starting so many amazing things that uh, impact the lives of all of us. I didn't expect to see you here, and I'm very happy to see you. And I know why he's here, because our next, be our next session is going to be a lot of fun. Many of you already know Dr. Nancy Newman, either from visiting her clinic at Emory Eye Center in Atlanta, or from hearing her speak here in 2017 or in Nashville in 2018. We are truly fortunate that Dr. Newman has devoted so much of her career to our rare disease, and she's now on the UMDF's Scientific and Medical Advisory Board, helping to keep LHON top of mind in the broader mitochondrial community. A few months ago, I had the privilege of being at the annual NANOS event. You heard me mention earlier that NANOS is the Neuroophthalmology Society, where all of the folks that uh, hopefully we eventually see and get treated by um, learn about neuro-ophthalmology. And I happened to be there, and uh, Dr. Newman received Nanos's highest honor for a lifetime of service to Nanos. And if you can see the photo on the screen, the people on stage behind her were the many, many fellows that she has trained over the years. Many of these are doctors now out there caring for us and our extended LHON family. And the fact that they've learned about LHON from Dr. Newman is very fortunate for all of us. We're going to cover several topics in this session. And first, Dr. Newman will begin by providing us with an update on the state of research for therapeutic options for LHON. I'm really glad to be here. I had a blast last year. Um, no country music here, but <laughs> I heard you went on the hill, and that's, that's a song and dance in and of itself. So. Okay. So um, I was asked by um, Lissa to update you on the, what's happening on the clinical research side. So I'm glad that Doug is sitting back there, back there and knows that I'm not going to touch on the wonderful things that he's doing, and we had a chance to catch up just recently, and he's still going at it strong, and he's, he's everything. Um, but so when think, people think, think about research, they think you go from bench to bedside, right? And Doug Wallace is the bench, and I'm the bedside. Uh, but the reality is it's really from bedside to bench to bedside, meaning you have to have rooted, your research rooted in a clinical problem to begin with because that's where it's all important. And so I've given talks on all these different sides, but I've been asked to talk now about the getting it from the bench to the bedside, so what's happening in research. So here are my financial disclosures. I'm an equal opportunity consultant for anybody, anybody <laughs> who's willing to do research on labors. Um, so when you talk about treatment for labors, I think right at the top is something that's not really a treatment, but in a way it's a psychological treatment, and that is genetic counseling. And I know we're going to do more of that later, but I, I just want to emphasize to all of you men in the audience who are affected, you cannot pass this disorder on. It is impossible. And yet the flip side of that, of course, is that affected or unaffected women who carry this disease will pass the risk of having labors to every single one of their children. And that's what we mean by maternal inheritance for this disorder. And then the second thing, just to get it out there, is that at least until we get that good mousetrap that we're trying to build, um, 
the key here is symptomatic therapy, symptomatic treatments. Now, it's very interesting. When I first started writing about labors, I came across the doctoral thesis of someone named Van Sinus, who's from the Netherlands. And he did an enormous uh, paper on all the Dutch families with labors hereditary optic neuropathy in 1963. So remember, this is way before uh, it was known that this was a mitochondrial DNA disorder. And he just gathered these patients and talked about them and then it, it described their vision. And if you look at the appendices of his dissertation, it talks about that despite their severe visual acuity loss, 82% of the affected labor's patients were gainfully employed. That's pretty incredible, isn't it? And I've always used that as a standard for, for you people. And whether it's because you're young and otherwise not affected by anything else, or whether it's because you still have your peripheral vision, I, I always thought that this was an amazing um, statistic. And the family that Doug and I know, the McGuire's who, who started this whole thing, they were working at Grady Hospital. You try to give them a, a, two a, a $5 bill instead of a $20 bill, I tell you, they knew it, okay? And, and they were all working. And um, so it was, it was a very optimistic thing. But in a more recent evaluation of this from out of the UK, it was noted that LHON affected patients had the worst uh, visual, acuity, visual acuity score for quality of life compared to patients with other ophthalmic disorders which, which, with this bad visual acuity, and that really upset me. And I think part of the difference is that back in 1963 in Holland, people didn't necessarily own a car, want to drive, watch TV, um, do a lot of the things that, that we have now that we expect to be able to do and to take for granted. So with that in mind, it is so important for each and every one of you to find a low vision service of some sort that can help improve your quality of life, help you with reading and navigating, uh, get you gainfully employed. I was really excited to see the lecture earlier, get you low vision aids, and then I know that Rustam's here and he's gonna talk about things that you can avoid um, tomorrow morning to, to avoid mitochondrial toxicity. The one that we all 100% agree on is don't smoke, okay? Do not create reactive oxygen species um, in, your, in your lungs, in your bloodstream, and probably heavy alcohol use is not a great idea uh, either. And then we can talk about what medications might be wise to avoid if, if you can. So what I'm really going to talk about now are the actual therapies. And most of you, I assume, in this room have probably been involved in the clinical trials that have been ongoing. Um, when you think about mitochondrial disorders and the hundreds of people who are here as part of the UMDF meeting, they are terribly jealous of the number of clinical trials available to patients with LHON because you're easily measurable. You know, you're, the, the endpoints are easily, easily measurable, and so you're, you're a very important uh, laboratory, for want of a better word to say, for, for them to try medications. And so I know all of you have been uh, very helpful in that regard. So let's first talk about are there disease-modifying agents out there, not outside of gene therapy, that have been used for mitochondrial diseases in general and for labors in uh, particular? Oh, and by the way, I'm supposed to say, so I've given you a set of slides to be distributed that are missing about five or six that are like unpublished data uh, on the most recent uh, gene therapy trials and things. So um, I'd prefer if you didn't take pictures when they come up there, and you, you've got what I'm allowed to give you. But anyway, um, the five categories of agents that have been purported as possibly being helpful in uh, patients with mitochondrial diseases in general include your vitamins and cofactors, 
things that scavenge free radicals. You, you've heard of oxidative damage, so things that, that scavenge those and, and don't allow them to be toxic to your cells. Uh, inhibitors of toxic metabolites, activators of mitochondrial uh, biogenesis and function, um, and anti-apoptotic agents, things that are against fight cell death. And amongst um, that group, we've tried a few things, and here is where I talk about labors as that laboratory that everybody wants to get their hands on. And the reason is, think about all the diseases you know, and especially think of other mitochondrial diseases. You've been around these other people here to actually witness as you walk by that they're very different from you. They have a, often a slowly progressive, inexorable, degenerative process that involves more than just their eye, their vision, right? And um, labors, it's a sudden onset, so you can know specifically when to treat. You have this sequential vision loss in at least 50% of you in which one eye goes and then there's a period of time before the second eye will become affected. So you've got this window of opportunity in which you can maybe get a treatment in there and if you stop that second eye, remember there's nearly a 100% chance that second eye is gonna go within the year. So if you could stop that second eye from happening, you'd need so few of you to prove that a treatment was working. Um, and you're, you have an accessibility to the tissue that's having the problem. Your retinal ganglion cells are the inner layer of your retina. I could give you an eye drop that diffuses to the retina. We, we do that for glaucoma all the time. Or I can take a needle and do an injection inside the eyeball, intravitreal injection, to get the agent right to where the cells are that need whatever it is I'm giving you. And so you would think that by now, we get it right. Um, and I'm gonna just historically show you a couple of things. So we were involved in the first attempt to stop the second eye from happening with an agent that was an eye drop that was thought to have uh, anti-apoptotic, to be neuronal protective. And it didn't work. It didn't work. And two things about this trial I want you to remember. One, it didn't work. And two, it took us two years to get nine patients. And I'm gonna come back to that in a minute. So we said, well, okay, it didn't work because the agent didn't work. But I'd like to show you just, if you look over here, so this is the typical thing. This eye, which is the left eye, was involved. This one was not. And then this got worse. And then it got worse. And then the right eye got involved, even with the drop. And then they both got bad. But if you look at the nine so-called uninvolved eyes over here, the ones that we were trying to keep from happening, if you look very carefully, wherever there's a black square, that means that something abnormal was happening. Seven out of nine of those patients already had something wrong with them. They already subclinically had had their vision loss starting. And so maybe we got in there too late, and that's a whole nother issue. So many of you, uh, I, uh, you know, for those of you who've had this disease a long time or know many people in your family who had, coenzyme Q10 for a while was the only thing we had to treat. And then came idebinone, which is a similar compound, but more effective. It stimulates ATP, and it's a free radical scavenger. And um, so that initiated these trials, again, you probably know of these, published in 2011 in Brain. Um, the first was a retrospective study by Valerio Corelli and his group in Bologna and in, in Italy, in which he basically, at some point, was seeing all these patients with labors, and then at some point he started treating them with various doses uh, of idebinone, they had to be within one year of onset, and he had followed them for five years. And as you can see from the graph, um, there was an increased frequency of improvement in those patients he gave idebinone, and it was related to getting the idebinone in 
uh, early, and although it may have delayed the second eye involved in those six patients or so that he had that had not had second eye involvement yet, unfortunately, all of them ultimately had their second eye involved to the same degree visually as their first eye. So, you know, medium results. And similarly, the Rodos trial, which came out, was the first randomized controlled trial uh, in Labor's hereditary optic neuropathy, and indeed, pretty much in any mitochondrial DNA disease. And what they did was they allowed uh, patients to be recruited uh, up to five years out from onset. And I think that, and they had to do that in order to get all the patients they needed. Remember, it took me two years to get nine patients, so they had 85 patients, and so they, they needed to make the, the criteria bigger and bigger to allow, to relax it more, to allow in, more people in. And I think they may have shot themselves in the foot a bit because you know, if you've had vision loss for that long with this, with this disease, the, the chances possibly of having an effect from an agent may be less. Um, and they found no adverse side effects, and there was a trend for better vision at six months, which was the end point in those that were treated, but not enough of a trend that they reached their primary end point. However, if they did a, a, what's called a sub hoc analysis, they went back and looked at just those patients who were treated who had two different visions in their eyes. Their eye visions were discordant, meaning they likely were early in their course. Well, they had about a four to five line difference on the eye chart. Um, and that then, you know, I, I have a, uh, there's a member of the company here. He's been so kind to, to lend me a slide here. But they went back then just recently and looked to see if it made any difference um, two things. One, instead of being a three-line difference as the endpoint, which they did not meet, what if we only made it a two-line on the eye chart difference, which if you talk to people here in the room, that's clinically relevant to them. And when they did that, if you see in the graph here, they basically showed that the patients with idebinone were more likely, still only 30%, but more likely to um, have this clinically relevant response um, than those who, did, who got placebo, and that was only 10%. And interestingly, when you took, did a group, subgroup analysis of those by duration of how long it had been since the onset of their vision loss, quite to my surprise, they actually found that that effect was was even better in those who were one to five years out as opposed to those within one year of duration. So again, it's not a robust response, but it's, you get the feeling there's something there. And, and this led to um, this international consensus statement, which was published in the Journal of Neuroophthalmology, where a whole bunch of us uh, got together and, and said some things about labors in general, and we're gonna get into that later about who should be tested and things like that. But one of the statements, um, because you know, idebinone was approved ultimately by the European Medicine Agency, which is the uh, FDA of Europe. It's not approved, as you know, here in the United States by the FDA, but the EMA uh, did approve it. And we, in our statement, said at least in subacute or dynamic patients, which pretty much is those within the first year or so, treatment at 900 milligrams a day should be continued for at least one year to assess the start of therapeutic response or until a plateau in terms of improvement uh, is reached. And um, there have been other trials, and, and they're not really trial trials. They're more observations of people being treated. And again, many of you are in these. So first of all, um, the uh, patients who were in Rodos were offered the chance to continue to receive uh, idebinone and to be followed. Um, the patients now who get it, because they can get it uh, via the, EM the EMA has allowed it in Europe, so they can get it if their doctors prescribe it 
are enrolled in another study to follow them. Um, there is a registry to try to help us with the natural history. And then the one that, that many of you are involved in that just closed is Leros, in which you've all been receiving idebinone, not placebo, and, that in, and, and that's open to all mutations, all three primary mutations. And, and the follow-up on that is going to be important, and we should probably get some results in a year, year and a half in that regard. Um, now, these slides, again, these are not in your packet. Again, looking at the natural history that you get from just retrospectively looking back at Labor's patients versus this extended program where they gave uh, idebinone to patients, there is, again, a suggestion that being treated with idebinone may give you a better chance for, I won't call it spontaneous recovery, for recovery. Again, using that definition of two lines on the eye chart. And it, there's also this hint that it doesn't necessarily stop, which is uh, making some uh, of us, uh, not me quite yet, but some people are keeping their patients on idebinone for longer than the one year that the consensus statement suggested. So what else is out there? So e EPI 743 uh, is kind of like a super, it was billed to be a super idebinone uh, because uh, supposedly it gets across the blood-brain barrier better. Um, Alfredo Sedun uh, and his group uh, reported on five patients treated with this. It really does not seem to be uh, out there for Labor's patients right now. Rustam, I assume you're not doing that anymore. Um, and Rustam, tomorrow uh, we'll be talking about ilamipratide or MTP-131, uh, which works by a different method of uh, action, although it also reduces reactive oxygen species. And um, I think Rustam's speaking on his trial tomorrow in that regard, so I'm going to let that one go. Um, and that takes me to gene therapy. And uh, again, this is very preliminary results I'm going to report. I just want you all to realize some of the difficulties that you have with gene therapy. You, you got to figure out a way to carry the gene into the cell. You got to figure out uh, that it gets in. And because this is mitochondrial DNA, you got to figure out a way to get it in the mitochondria. Um, and you got to integrate it so it works with the other things that are in the mitochondria. And you got to make sure it's safe and that it's lasting if it works. And one of the key problems that you all need to, because you guys hear about gene therapy all the time, right? Gene therapy everywhere else is talking about gene therapy for the nuclear chromosomes. And we're pretty good at that. We actually have viruses that we can get a gene to incorporate into the nucleus of our cells. Um, but you remember, we have our nucleus with our our, our uh, chromosomes, but we got hundreds of, of mitochondria, and each of those mitochondria have lots of circles of mitochondrial DNA. And it is very challenging to get DNA, even with the, a viral vector, directly into mitochondria and the mitochondrial genome. And very, very smart people like Doug Wallace are working on that, and I'm very excited because I know he's going to do it. Before, before we die, okay, Doug? <laughs> you, you promised me you were going to cure this disease. Okay. Um, so what are the forms of gene therapy? There's one I really want to talk to you about, which in its own way is not really gene therapy. And that's um, something called nuclear transfer techniques, which you all now, I think the, the term that's going around out in the UMDF meeting that they like to use is mitochondrial replacement therapy, or MRT. And, and in general, there are different ways to do this, but a simplified explanation is the following. You take mom's egg, and mom has mutant mitochondria, right? Mitochondrial DNA abnormalities. 
You take mom's egg with the mutant mitochondria and you take, you extract her nucleus with all the chromosomes, nuclear chromosomes. And then you take a donor egg with normal mitochondrial DNA and you extract her nucleus and you put mom's nucleus into this donor cytoplasm with normal mitochondria and mitochondrial DNA. And then you do in vitro fertilization with the sperm of the partner, and then you reimplant it in mom. And you basically cure your disease you, you, by prevention, <laughs> right? Because you have cured it in the germline, and then all the descendants from then on don't have mitochondrial DNA abnormalities. And if you think that this is something out of Star Wars and the futuristic, then you haven't been looking at the most important medical journals out there, the New York Times and the Washington Post. <laughs> and this is from 2016, when it wasn't a Labor's case, it was a NARP case, a Lee syndrome case but a point mutation in mitochondrial DNA, and a US doctor went to Mexico to help a Jordanian couple conceive a baby with what they called three genetic parents, and that little boy is three years old, and he's doing fine, as far as I know. So it is something that is becoming clinically available in countries like the UK, where they're in the appropriate institution and the appropriate setting that if people want this, they will be able to get it. This is not something that's been approved by our methods here, uh, our government on the Hill, guys. Um, so it is not available to uh, Americans yet, but I just want you to be aware of that because that at least stops it in a family. Okay, now, and the kid is still nuclear mom and nuclear dad. Now, we don't know the long-term effects of this. We'll be watching that boy very carefully and watching what's happening in the UK very carefully because nuclear DNA has to talk to mitochondrial DNA. Um, but again, we'll see what happens. Um, but let's go to the, um, the last thing, which is the gene therapy trials that many of you have been part of, and they use the basis of what's called allotopic rescue. And to understand what allotopic rescue is, here we have our nucleus with our chromosomes, right? And here we have our mitochondria with our mitochondrial DNA. And what you have to understand is the way that things function is that DNA makes proteins, and the proteins are what do the function. And so mitochondrial DNA actually makes its own proteins right there in the mitochondria, and those proteins are necessary for mitochondrial function. But 90% of the proteins necessary for mitochondrial function are actually coded for on the nuclear chromosomes made on the endoplasmic reticulum in the cytoplasm of the cell, and then they are told by a little special tag that they should go to the mitochondria where they complement the proteins made by mitochondrial DNA. Okay, that's how we all work. That's our normal way that our cells work. And so what allotopic rescue is, is it takes advantage of this. Because remember what I said, we don't have the technology yet to do gene therapy directly into mitochondrial DNA, right? So what we do is we send via a virus the normal gene that's abnormal in the mitochondrial DNA, we get it into the nuclear DNA with that little special tag on it that when that protein is made in the cytoplasm, that protein knows it's supposed to go to the mitochondria. And that's called allotopic rescue. And all the gene therapy trials to date have used this me mechanism. And all of the gene therapy trials to date have used the 11778, known as the Wallace mutation, um, <laughs> because it is the most common and the one that most severely affects the vision. And so it's been shown in animal models, 
to the allotopic rescue to, be, to, to work, at least in the animal models that we had. Um, it's been shown to be safe in humans, both just as in the animal models, both in France and in Miami with John Guy's group. And then the group in China has also shown it to be safe and has begun to suggest, as the trials here have, that there may be a hint of some efficacy as well, and they are the first to do that. I will point out that they used patients who could be as young as four years old. So we know that people who are young when they have their vision loss from labors are more likely to have spontaneous recovery. So you have to look at it a little bit carefully and you have to look at, if they're long-term results, some things that were quite interesting, which is not everybody got better. And when they did get better, both the treated and the untreated eyes got better. And we're going to get back to that very interesting point uh, soon. But there are also plenty of folks who didn't get better. So do we have responders and non-responders? Or what? we're not sure what's going on. So at the University of Miami, and I'm sure we have some people here who have participated, their gene therapy trial, again, with the 11778 mutation, is studying three groups for both safety and efficacy. And the group one is the chronic, meaning they have to have bad vision in both eyes, and it has to have been present for more than one year. Group two, they have to have bad vision in both eyes, but the, the onset has to be within one year. And group three is they have to have bad vision in one eye and good vision in the other, better than 2040. And the, uh, it is the best eye, the good eye, that's injected. And then they escalate three different doses for three patients uh, each time. And so at this point, we have some early results from that. As you can imagine, those who have bad vision and who are out for a year, there really was no effect. Looking at those within one year, uh, Dr. Guy reported in, at Arvo this year that his medium dose people did not respond, but the low dose did, which is a little unusual. And But if you look at the, the actual numbers, uh, the actual individual patients, I think what's happening, is, so this was his medium dose in the two eyes. Here you see one eye was just an amazing responder, and that has driven the median effect of those three patients. So it's, and, and this one both improved. So it's a little hard to claim real efficacy just as of yet. Um, I did tell him I offered, and I hope none of you fall, end up answering this call because it would mean you'd have to be affected, but I, uh, and I don't want anybody to be affected, but uh, he still is enrolling six more patients. So if you know anybody who fits the criteria, so he needs three patients who have had only one eye involved as soon as that first eye is involved to get his last high dose. And he needs three patients for the group one, the chronic bilateral, who are just out of one year, so just more than one year uh, for the highest dose that he was required to treat. So there are six slots for patients right now. And the reason I make a point of that is because there is not a single other gene therapy trial recruiting right now. Everything else is closed and done, um, except in China. So th those are the only six slots left if this is something you want to proceed with. Um, so to talk about the Genside trials, they were called rescue and reverse. I know there's some people here in the audience who participated, thank you so much. Um, that both trials are identical except reverse. You had to have onset within um, six months to one year of when you got your injection. And in rescue, it had to be both eyes uh, acute, meaning less than six months or less 
from uh, your onset of your vision loss. And the way it was randomized is one eye would receive an injection of the gene therapy and one eye would receive a sham injection. And the idea was that we were going to compare the injected eye to the sham eye, believing that the natural history was what we thought it was um, and that uh, we would see a difference between the two eyes. And interestingly, here are the results of reverse. Uh, first of all, it was well tolerated. There's a little inflammation in the eye when you inject it, but nothing that was permanent in any way. Um, and we are now up to 96 week uh, data. So almost two years if I'm adding my weeks correctly. Um, and you can see that both, eye, this is the visual acuity chart, both eyes improved. Um, and indeed the, the treated eye got to the end point that we were hoping, which was three lines or more, but so did the untreated eye, 15 letters versus 13 letters. Um, and if you use the uh, criteria that the Santhera has used for the retrospective look sub-analysis for their ROTOS trial of clinically relevant responder, meaning two lines or to go from off chart to on chart, um, the, both the treated eyes and the sham treated eyes did better than we would have expected with 68% of reverse subjects achieving a clinically relevant response in at least one eye at two years. So there's, there's something there. Um, similarly, if you say who's 2200, who's better than 2200, which would, be, which would mean not legally blind, there were GS, the, the, the treated eyes were significantly more likely to be better than legal blindness than the sham eyes, sham treated eyes by four to, almost four to one. The problem is the numbers who actually were in that category are not robust. It's not that many patients. Um, contrast sensitivity, the same kind of picture, a, a tendency for the treated eye to, to, be, to do better, um, but both eyes improving and not meeting the outcome. And then quality of life. Again, this could be very placebo-driven, right? You're in a trial, you wanna believe you're doing better, but people did say that at um, 96 weeks that they were, had a better quality of life than at baseline. Um, rescue, the, the short one, again, this is all unpublished results, very similar except the difference being that a number of the rescue patients were still on their way down in their vision before something happens, whether it's natural or whether it was an effect of the drug or it's really not clear. Remember, any kind of gene therapy like this will take at least four, possibly eight weeks for the gene therapy to get into the cells and do what it's supposed to do. So in the meantime, the vision loss will continue. Um, same with contrast sensitivity, turning up from nadir. And if you look at uh, reverse and rescue next to each other, the difference, of course, is that reverse, uh, sorry, rescue, we started uh, when patients were closer to the onset of their disease and they continue to get worse before they would get better. You can actually lay one right on top of the other. This is where reverse came in and you see it goes up. And this is where rescue, we got rescue, and it came down first and then went up. So what, it, what, what does it mean? Well, a number of you know that we've finished Reflect as far as recruitment. I have no data to show you for that. Um, 90 subjects with vision loss within one year were recruited in less than a year and a half. Uh, it was extraordinary. And in these cases, everybody gets uh, injected, actual injections. Um, everybody gets one eye injected with the drug and the second half the people get the second eye injected with drug and the other half get the second eye injected with placebo. 
And that second eye is the best seeing eye to try to give it the best chance. Um, and I don't have results to give you. Um, you know the centers, they're all over the world and um, we can only hope that, that we see something good. Now, I've shown you in the Chinese study, in the, um, the uh, uh, John Guy study, in at least two of those patients, and in reverse and uh, rescue, that this other eye is doing better than we usually would have thought for the natural history. Now, what is that? Is this just placebo effect? People in clinical trials are trying harder. We don't know. It seems a lot for that. Is this, is the natural history of labors better than we thought? Are you all getting better and we just haven't followed you closely over all this time in the past to know? And we were stupid when we put the trial together. Did we make a mistake? Um, or is there some effect when you inject one eye that it goes back along that optic nerve and affect the other eye, and although that seems terribly far-fetched, there are some good studies uh, in animals and in human, other human diseases where there is no question there has been an effect uh, in, because of that. And, and there are now specifically studies being done in uh, rodent models and in monkey models to, with tracers to see if that actually is happening uh, with this gene therapy. So it leaves us with a lot of questions. Maybe we're not using the correct outcome measures. If the quality of life is better in our patients after these trials, maybe it's not because they got three lines of vision back. Maybe there's something we're not measuring well that, that they're doing better with. Um, are we, you know, we do things from baseline. If we get these patients early, maybe we're keeping the nadir, the bottom, from being worse than it might have been. We're keeping it from getting worse, um, and yet it still, if we compare to baseline, would be a failure of treatment because it, the, the end result at the nadir, at the bottom, is still worse than at baseline, but without the drug, maybe the nadir would have been way lower, and it's very hard to, to design a trial where you can measure that. Um, People don't do well on the visual field test. Those of you who've been in these trials where we've made you do color vision and visual field, and, and your vision's too bad for it to help, uh, for us to measure anything. But it's a standard measure the FDA required, so we did it, and we just had a meeting all day today where we were saying, telling the guy from the FDA, we can't, it, it's useless for these kind of, of, of disorders. Um, and then, we just need better functional outcomes. And then, are we treating too late? You know, everyone out here knows about uh, brain is vision. Uh, brain is, um, oh, sorry, time is brain, right? The stroke uh, campaigns out there that you, you know, get somebody in within four hours of their stroke and you can bust their clot and everything. Maybe that's what we need with labors, especially if it takes time for these gene therapies to work or other therapies to work. Maybe time is vision. Maybe we need as soon as somebody is diagnosed or as soon as they start having vision loss to get the, the therapies uh, in quicker. So my last slide is this, though, and I, I hope this is, hasn't been too depressing. In, in many ways, it is terribly depressing to me. I'm sure it's terribly depressing to Doug because we had tremendously high hopes um, for these gene, gene therapy trials. I'm not saying they're negative, but they're not the slam dunk we really, really, really hoped for, where we wouldn't even need statisticians to tell us whether there is an effect or not. We're not giving up. Um, Doug's working on another mousetrap. Um, we're gonna, we're, 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 we're going there. But, but what you all have done as a community is unbelievable, and of course, you know I talk about Lissa all the time this way, and she gets very embarrassed and she starts to blush. Um, but what she's doing with the rest of you now, creating an organization that's even stronger because you're, there are more of you involved in the actual organization part in its tripartite uh, mission, but I would, I would throw a little something out at you. 
two years to get nine patients in the entire United States, right? Lissa, how many patients have you referred to all these gene therapy trials and the idebinone trials? And it must be over 200 patients in, in three years? Wow. You know? And that's, and, that's, and that's you guys, because you're willing, too, to make sure your families are educated, that instead of being like an ostrich, which would be the, my immediate response, I'd want to find a hole and put my head in it, um, you know, you get somebody who could potentially be in a clinical trial, and you've been all in. Um, and so that's a testament to not only Lisa and her organization, but to all of you. Thank you.